Hi everybody and welcome to the Zen Palace of Healing with yours truly, Javier. So today's topic, I'm going to inform you and educate you all about hypertension or aka essential hypertension. HTN is just the abbreviated form of hypertension in the medical language. But again, this is not only intended for uh, students and doctors alike. This is also intended for you if you have high, high blood pressure and you want to know um, how to address it. Or if you know somebody who has high blood pressure, which you will most likely will, this also is going to help you inform about what you can do about it. Because there's a lot of information here, I made this into a three video series. That way we're not, I'm not overwhelming you and not, I'm not overwhelming myself as well to put all that information in at once. But I hope you enjoy it and also subscribe and like my videos and also I'm also always open to positive criticism or what you would like to see as well. Alright, so let's get started. And before we actually get started, I just want to let you know, as it's written here, that 29% of the U.S. population has hypertension or high blood pressure. That's one in three Americans. Which is why I said you most likely know somebody who does have high blood pressure. And well, I'll explain why. All right, so first, before we get into all the science of hypertension and high blood pressure, let's talk about what it is. What is considered high blood pressure? So high blood pressure is passing the numbers of 139 over 89 millimeters of mercury. So when you go to a pharmacy or if you go to the doctor's office, office and you do a high blood pressure reading, if your numbers are 140 over 90 or higher than that, then you are considered to be in a high blood pressure state. So you gotta be, this is the point you should be concerned about your health and seek medical attention sooner than later. And unfortunately, like the picture says here, a high score is not a good thing. So, where does the blood pressure come from? Like, why do we get blood pressure? There's actually a lot of reasons why. Obesity, alcohol consumption, drinking too much, smoking, heavy metal toxicity, which kind of goes together with smoking. And it's been linked that cadmium let me write it here, cadmium is a connection between uh, heavy metal smoking and high blood pressure. Insulin resistance it's also another risk of high blood pressure or at least it's not going to help. So those of you with type 2 diabetes keep be extra careful. And then with, when it comes to diet, usually people with high intake of salt and low intake of magnesium and calcium are minerals that are going to most likely cause hypertension as well. But again, it's either a mixture of all these things or a few of these things. Alright, so most of this video is going to be dedicated to this part, pathophysiology. What is really going on? Because hypertension is such a complex topic, I decided to talk about three main focuses. One, it's going to be the renin angiotensin aldosterone system dysfunction. I know that's a mouthful, but I'll explain what that is. And it's going to, once you understand that, you're going to understand how pharmaceuticals and natural therapies help with this. Second, it's going to be cardiac output and peripheral resistance. So kind of like how the heart is involved in all of this. And the arteries. And then lastly, it's going to be the endothelial dysfunction, which is definitely not the least of the issues that people have with high blood pressure. And again, I'll explain all of this, so don't get discouraged that you may not understand what this really means. All 
All right, so first thing we're going to discuss is going to be angiotensin, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Sorry about that. So try to form, so this is a system actually to regulate blood pressure and it's based from the kidneys. The kidneys have a system called the juxtaglomerular apparatus that detects how strong blood pressure should be and they're very sensitive cells. So this is how it works. When there is low blood pressure, EP is blood pressure, when it's low, what's going to happen is the kidneys, right here, this is the kidneys, it's going to send a hormone called renin, if you can read it here. So renin is going to interact with another hormone from the liver called angiotensinogen, or tensinogen. Just be aware that the term organ means inactive. Uh, it's a time again. It's an inactive hormone or protein. So that means that without renin, angiotensinogen is not going to do anything to the body. But when renin works with angiotensin, they mix, then angiotensin 1, angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1, it's, it's made. So once angiotensin 1 is created, this hormone is going to go to the lungs. Here, I'm going to put a nail for the lungs because this is what they're supposed to show. And then in the lungs, in the capillaries of the lungs, there's going to be something called an enzyme called ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme. And that enzyme in the lungs is going to make angiotensin 2. Okay, and then this is the active form that's going to cause two things. Here it just shows one, which is goes to the adrenal glands, which is right on top of the kidneys. And it's going to make aldosterone. And aldosterone is going to inhibit release of water and sodium. So I'm going to circle right here the sodium and water. So it's going to get absorbed back in the body and that is going to help increase blood pressure. So we started with low blood pressure to high blood pressure based on this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The other thing that angiotensin 2 does here, I'm going to put a 1 here and then 2. It, it, it does is basal constriction. It's a mouthful and I'll explain what that is. But basically what that does is it makes the arteries tighter so the blood pressure can increase as well. So these two things will cause the goal of this thing is to increase blood pressure when you have low blood pressure. But as we know with any system, something can go wrong and there can be a dysfunction as well. Or damage in these detectors and that can create a vicious cycle of non-stop high pressure. And we're going to get to that as to how that happens. So good so far with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? Good. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Cardiac output and peripheral resistance. So I put definitions here to see what, what they really are, and I'll explain what they are based on an analogy. Cardiac output, the first thing, is the blood pumped by the heart per minute. So this is going to talk about, well, this one is actually mentioning the heart itself. So let's put a little heart right here. 
and it's gonna talk about how strong is the heart pumping the blood okay in an analogy you can think about a faucet being turned on that's connected to a hose So the faucet will, will determine if you turn it all the way up, then it's gonna throw a lot of water, so it's gonna cause a high pressure. If you turn it very little, then it's gonna cause low, low pressure. And the, the blood is gonna travel through this and come out outside where it would, um, say, feed the plants or something. The other term, that I put here is something called peripheral resistance and this one is how the vessels, the blood vessels including the arteries and the veins resist to keep the blood from expanding their walls so in this case the picture that I put here is like hand pressure on the holes before it expands so right here is an excellent example you have the cardiac output, the heart pumping and then you have the water coming out of this way from peripheral resistance and then the pressure that's being developed inside but when you put a hand at, at one spot of the holes what's going to happen is the walls are going to have pressure the walls of the holes or the elasticity the elastic part of the holes they're going to expand and the, ex the expansion is going to cause to either force more pressure this way or expand the walls and damage the walls so that's gonna damage this part so that's what peripheral resistance means it means the artery wall that has its own strength but then it, it starts getting weak over time because of the pressure is not stopping whatsoever and then of course I put the definition for blood pressure because that's the definition of blood pressure is how strong the heart pumps blood into the arteries or to the arteries so that will be the water pushing through the hose so I hope that makes a little bit more sense from the hose analogy how blood pressure is measure so and then I put up here a little formula blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance they're all related if one goes out of control the other ones will be affected as well they're all connected so that's also important to remember all right next thing is going to be cardiac output and peripheral resistance causing hypertension but why? why does it do that? well basically because the autonomic nervous system is imbalanced what is the autonomic nervous system? you may ask that is actually a very nice summary here in this picture the autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system the fight or flight or the rest and digest parasympathetic is the, is the time of stress and it could be a stress from running away from something or there's a fire and you have to act quickly or there's but on the other hand there's also mental stress emotional stress um, doing too much work all those things and it's gonna cause um, your blood vessels and your blood pressure to rise so this causes high blood pressure but on the parasympathetic part, the rest and digest this causes low blood pressure because you're just resting you're digesting you're eating well and you're relaxed so we have the stress and relax mode sympathetic means stress, parasympathetic, relax so this imbalance is shifted to the stress 
So that's how hypertension, one of the causes of how hypertension can, um, can happen from. All right, number three. Hope you guys are still with me because this is a lot of stuff and I know this is not easy to understand at first, but try to, to bear with me and I'm doing my best to explain as well. So endothelium, cells that surround the, blood, the vessel walls. This is gonna tell us about endothelial dysfunction. So here I put a little picture, very, very nice representation from this website, the Molecular Cell Biology website. Uh, about an artery. So this is an artery. And then endothelium is going to be this outside, the, the central layer of cells. And it's right here also. And the endothelium, this is what's going to get the pressure. This is what's going to detect what the pressure is in an artery. But also when it's too much pressure and there's damage going on, this endothelium is what gets damaged, hence the endothelial dysfunction. Now, why, what is this? These are called smooth muscle cells. The smooth muscle cells, what they're going to do, is they're going to cooperate to either relax or contract the blood vessels. So, let's say this is the normal diameter. This one right here is the normal diameter of the vessel. But then when they relax, by a chemical called nitrous oxide, it's going to cause vasodilation, which means the wall of the artery is going to get larger. Larger diameter. But then when there's contraction, they, the blood vessels contract by endothelin or many other chemicals, because this is just one example of them, it's going to cause a vasoconstriction. Hence, a smaller diameter. Any basic constriction is what is thought to cause hypertension as well. So this is all based on the smooth muscles. So that's how uh, an artery and or a vein, well, you, mostly an artery, usually an artery, gets either larger or smaller. It's based on the smooth muscle cells. And this is important to know also to understand the pharmaceutical perspective or what therapies are done. All right, so endothelial dysfunction causes and conditions. So what? why does the endothelium get damaged? Simply metabolic syndrome. So the metabolic syndrome is a combination of diseases where the body is not able to regulate itself based on our poor diet, or at least that's the most common cause. Of metabolic syndrome, and that includes diabetes, obesity, high triglycerides, and cholesterol. Those are a few examples, there's more, but I just wanna mention those few. Smoking is also another damaging um, habit, at least the tobacco smoking from cigarettes, that causes damage to the endothelium, right here, endothelial injury. So a damaged endothelium is going to cause a state of hypercoagulability. There, I said it right. Or thrombosis, or more simply, clots. When you're damaging the endothelium, the clots are there to repair. But then when you're making too many repairs, these clots are going to get out of control and they're going to start clogging arteries. 
That's why people with hypertension have high risk of stroke as well. Alright, so I hope this makes sense. And this is all I have for the pathophysiology of and the definition of hypertension. So stay tuned for the next video and I'll talk about the, the clinical aspect of it. Signs and symptoms, evaluation, and what to do about it. Alright, so give it a like if you enjoyed the video. And if you have any other questions regarding this, please let me know. And we'll see you in the next video. Alright, see you then.